Well, 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 why don't we start with BRICS? Because I, I understand that Professor Sachs has just been to Beijing. And, of course, there's been a whole troop of people going to Beijing. We've had Prime Minister Sanchez there. We're going to have President Macron of France there. Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, is there. The I believe there are more European visitors heading towards Beijing. But, of course, Jeffrey Sachs has been there on the spot taking, gauging the mood in Beijing. And to my mind, the fact that all these important people are going to Beijing, in a sense, tells its own story. It says that Beijing is the place where a lot of decisions are being made. And I don't know what your feelings about that are, Professor Sachs, and what the mood was, what you found there. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, uh, actually, this... Uh, uh, this uh, stream of uh, delegations uh, going, I, I think it is the the new shape of the world. Uh, I found the uh, Chinese leadership to be in uh, good spirits, I would say, uh, not uh, very calm in a, in a real uh, Chinese uh, dignified way. Uh, I had a chance to uh, see the new premier in action, uh, met with several of the cabinet uh, ministers uh, at uh, a three-day gathering of uh, business leaders and, and some academics and so on. And and the mood is actually, you know, very uh, calm, uh, rather insistent that um, the world needs to get itself uh, right uh, and that it is not uh, right right now, but that uh, China's uh, view of things uh, you know, can uh, push developments forward. Um, uh, the foreign minister spoke uh, very well uh, about uh, China creating a, a new multilateralism, uh, about uh, China forging uh, new expanded relations all over the world. Uh, the economics uh, team, uh, which I met, was rather optimistic, actually. You know, this is a, a, an expanding economy this year, and the Asian Development Bank just issued its uh, report uh, 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 increasing its forecast for Asian growth overall for the nearly 50 countries that they track. So Asia looks very different from our, our view, uh, you know, from, from the North Atlantic region, which is uh, in crisis, uh, uh, unpopular leaders uh, everywhere, uh, a lot of economic turmoil, a banking crisis, uh, geopolitical crisis. Uh, the view from China is really quite different and, and uh, very impressive in that regard. I think you're on mute, Alexander. Oh, I am. There you go. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, um, since you met the economics team, I was just going to say, uh, ask this question, because one of the things you read a lot here in the British media, at least, is that there's been a sort of regression in Chinese economic policy, that they're taking a much more interventionist uh, uh, line, that they're going back on some of the reforms that they carried out. Do you get any of that impression at all? I mean, I haven't seen myself any sign of this from afar, but that is what people are saying. I mean, it's a change no, I mean, direction. It, it, look, the, the message is uh, quite the contrary, which uh, this was actually a gathering in which uh, the uh, Chinese leadership kept uh, emphasizing, you know, we're open for business, we're reopened after, uh, after COVID, uh, but we're open uh, geopolitically uh, for all regions mm -hmm. of the world. I think the only place where you see uh, that, uh, you know, taking place is is not in broad economic strategy, but in reaction to the U.S. technology uh, attempts to uh, choke uh, China on uh, advanced uh, semiconductors and and other high tech. And what what they're doing there is uh, reacting in in the sense of saying we're going to achieve our own self-sufficiency in these key technologies in a relatively short period of time. And I'm pretty optimistic that they will because there's a long history of the U.S. Uh, attempts to contain technology 
technology doesn't stay contained the way that uh, the, the U.S. wants. Uh, you can go back to, uh, you know, actually the, the uh, atomic bomb where the U.S. said, we'll have a monopoly on this for 30 years. Uh, and it turned out to be three years. And this is how technology is. There are a lot of smart people. Uh, China's pro mass producing engineers <laughs> of, the, of the top rank uh, as well. But that's the only place where I would say, uh, you know, you have this uh, kind of uh, reaction. Otherwise, China's expanding the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's absolutely expanding its economic relations uh, with the Middle East, we know, uh, with uh, Latin America. Uh, and my feeling is one of the most pivotal things for us to watch is uh, China-India relations. And I think that those are going to improve uh, markedly, actually, in, in the coming months uh, and years. And that may be the most important bilateral relationship, actually, in the world, the two giant countries. India is growing quite rapidly now on, on the basis of uh, digitalization. Uh, and if the two, which I think they have every reason to, say, you know, we're basically in the same position trying to create a, a space in a multipolar world, that, that will be a very big deal. And I got the sense both in China and in India that there's pretty deep recognition of, of that reality. Because it's, I think, fair to say that there have been periods, there was a period just after India gained independence and China, uh, you know, the Communist Party came to power in China, when there was, in the 50s, when India and China were very good, were on very good terms and actually uh, were working together very effectively on international affairs. So this would, in a sense, be a revert, a reversion to this. Is this going to happen because... It's both a positive that they feel that they need to do this because it's in their joint interests, or is it a negative because they feel that there are pressures on them that they need to resist, and that means coming to terms with each other? You know, I, I think it's because it's uh, absolutely natural that there should be cooperation. And the one thing that, uh, you know, hinders it is actually border disputes in the high Himalayas that have no major significance for either country at all. I don't want to completely dismiss them, but they can work out pragmatically that that is not a, any basis at all for derailing what should be extremely important e economic ties, just straight trade and technology ties hmm. should be very important. But then all the geopolitics that they both absolutely see eye to eye that we need to move past a, a Western-led world, which is exactly what's taking shape before our eyes these weeks and months. That by itself would be sufficient also to say we, uh, we have a, a good cause for coordination. So I see it as a pretty deep reason for cooperation, and I think it's going to come. Do you think when you were in Beijing, um, I mean, because again, a lot of talk about China suddenly becoming aggressive, thinking about war in Taiwan. Were they in a war mood? I mean, was that at all evident? Or you said that they were calm and optimistic. That suggests on the contrary that they're not, that this is not really, again, what they're about at, at all at the moment. Well, you know, it's also the style of Chinese diplomacy, completely the opposite of saber rattling or announcing uh, threats and war it every word that we heard from every cabinet member politburo member the premier was about peace multilateralism cooperation the need for sustainable development the openness for business it was look it was a charm offensive to begin with but that's also telling uh, it was not that we're in deep crisis, we're about to go to war, we're mobilizing, no one should uh, threaten us. You know, they may say that in other venues, but that is certainly not the style or the feel of the diplomacy. The feel of the diplomacy is, let's reduce tensions. There's no reason for them. Uh, we have business to do. Uh, we have uh, challenges to meet, including common challenges like the energy transition. 
they really believe that, and for very good reason. And they know they have a lot of internal development issues as well. They're aiming for the next quarter century to make huge advances in quality of life in China. They face, like everybody, the aging population and other things. So there were there was lots of interesting substantive talk about quality of life and normal issues. But war was not the discussion. What was the discussion was we need to have a peaceful, multilateral world without threats. So we really need to calm down and, uh, and work together. And that was absolutely the rhetoric at every point. It's very interesting that you said that the big relationship could be India-China, which by the way, I completely agree with. But of course, that's not what most people are saying. Most people are still saying that the big relationship is China, the United States. What is the feeling about the United States? Is it exasperation? Is it fear? Are people becoming angry with the policies or are they still th saying to themselves, well, maybe this is just a, you know, period of tension, but it will pass. We'll be able to get back with the U.S. Uh, before long. I, I think the main mood was a, a bit of perplexity and exasperation. Uh, I had at least 100 people come up to me and said, what's going on in your country? You know, we, we don't understand it. Uh, where is this anti-China animus coming from? Uh, we don't get it. Uh, so there's there really is a perplexity. Uh, there was, a, you know, in high level discussions that I was happy to have a real question. Why is there the war in Ukraine? You know, why did the U.S. push? Uh, what's the basis of this? Why does this make sense? Uh, and so forth. And so I think there was puzzlement because the U.S. is you know, underperforming its fundamentals. Let's put it this way. This is a, a country uh, in a bit of a self-created collapse of foreign policy. Uh, it's losing friends and influence, not just because of a gradual shift of the world, but because it's making poor choices everywhere, making threats, wagging fingers, telling major countries what to do, what not to do. And it's, you know, viewed in a with puzzlement because uh, they're not saying, well, oh, we're afraid, what's the U.S. going to do? But, you know, doesn't the U.S. want any friends anymore? Is, is this really uh, just growling, uh, expected to get somewhere? So I think there's mostly perplexity, a lot of annoyance, no doubt, uh, especially over an overt U.S. foreign policy that says on its face, our aim is to hinder China's economy. You know, it's quite a foreign policy. It's not directed uh, at uh, any specific thing. It's, 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 it's taken as uh, normal that U.S. politicians would say China's uh, economic development is not in our interest. It's pretty arrogant position. So I think there's annoyance at that. But I wouldn't say that uh, this was the overwhelming concern. Uh, I think the feeling of, and it makes sense from China's perspective, is, you know, if the U.S. is going to be that way, we've, we've got another 96% of the world population to deal with. It's a, it's a little bit weird. We're not anti-U.S. We'd, uh, you know, be happy to have normal relations, uh, but I think the feeling is we can move on also. And uh, and I think that feeling makes sense, actually. Uh, this makes sense in many of the areas where I'm working, uh, trying to, you know, push uh, for a more effective global financial system and so on, mm -hmm. where the U.S. is definitely the laggard, uh, you say, oh, you can't pass any, you know, constructive reforms through Congress. But my feeling is, OK, if the U.S. doesn't want to play, there's there's the rest of the world uh, to to move forward. And I think that that really is the Chinese view. And and I think the Indians are you know coming to that view as well. But we got a lot of issues at home. We have a lot of issues internationally, and we're not going to let one country and its snarling and its sanctions and its unilateral measures and its uh, reports about us uh, tell us what to do. 
and they had a new IBM laptop, which was brand new at the time that the US had given them. And I typed a memo all night and at 7 a.m. gave it back to Koran, uh, how to make a market economy. So that was my all-nighter uh, of uh, writing this. If anyone's interested, I'd be happy to email it to you because many years later, someone found it in the archives and sent it to me. So I actually have a copy of that all night. And that became the basis of the Valtorovich plan to an, an important extent, actually. And the idea was to make the currency convertible and open the borders to trade right away. That was the basic idea. And to back it up with two core um, financial steps. One was a lot of aid. And the key was something I recommended called the Polish Zwoty Stabilization Fund, which was to give reserves for this new convertible currency. And the second was debt cancellation. And um, that theory became called the seven postcards theory, because the night that the Mazowiecki came into power, there was a meeting of the OKP, which was the Polish, the Solidarity Members of Parliament. And they invited two speakers that night, outside speakers. One was Senator Dole, who was the US chief senator, and he was there representing President Bush. And they invited me to speak. And it worked out very well because Senator Dole spoke first and said, the American people will do anything for the freedom of Poland. And then I stood up and I said, I agree with Senator Dole. And that's why I'm sure that America will cancel all of Poland's debts. Uh, and so I said, the way out of this is seven postcards, one to each of the G7 countries, uh, and uh, tell them, thank you very much, but the Soviet era debts are gone. Um, and in the end, Poland got about 60% of its debts canceled. Uh, the last step was Germany, because Germany was very resistant to canceling debt, as you can imagine. Uh, and. Uh, it took Balcerowicz, I sent Balcerowicz a copy of the 1953 London Agreement between post-Nazi Germany and the West, canceling the pre-World War II German debt. And Balcerowicz handed it to Helmut Schmidt, who looked at it in the meeting and said, you know, you have a point. Uh, and, uh, ended up Germany supported the cancellation of the debt also. Not 100% as I wanted, 60%. Uh, so that was uh, the, the origins of that. But it's worth all this reminiscing, I hope, to make a geopolitical point, which is that after that happened, I was asked by Grigory Yavlinsky, who was advisor to Gorbachev, to help President Gorbachev in 1990. And I believed that Gorbachev's idea, what he called the common European home, was exactly the right idea for Europe and for the Soviet Union. This is before the end of the Soviet Union. But Gorbachev said we should have a democratic Soviet Union and it should be open to, completely open, and we should have a peaceful, European home, in fact, that stretches from Rotterdam to Vladivostok. I loved Gorbachev. I thought he was a man of incredible integrity and decency, basically, because he believed don't shoot people. This was his most core belief, don't shoot people. That was remarkable for a Soviet leader. Uh, and, uh, it, and it was the greatest statesmanship of the age. And so he, as you know, and Hungary led the way in every way, opening the borders and, and uh, showing the different path. Uh, Gorbachev said, we will dismantle the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and it happened at the time that Helmut Kohl and Hans Dietrich Genscher and 
George Bush and James Baker said, whoa, that's good. That's big. If you do that, we won't move NATO one inch eastward. And so a deal was made in 1990. It's a very explicit deal. Uh, it's not just a conversation. It was actually a very deeply discussed and negotiated deal. So the deal was NATO, Warsaw Pact ended, NATO not moving at all, Germany reunified. And that was the deal, and I believed in that deal and believed in Gorbachev. Uh, and I recommended that the Soviet Union also get financial help because it was in a state of collapse, a failed economic system, a disastrous social conditions. And Gorbachev, of course, had borrowed a lot short term in the mid 1980s to try to prop up the system and all of that debt was coming due and oil prices had collapsed at the end of the 1980s. So the Soviet Union was in a very sharp short-term financial crisis. So with Yavlinsky and some of my colleagues at Harvard, we wrote a document which we called the Grand Bargain, which was that Gorbachev would continue the democratic reforms and the West would help the Soviet Union with this financial transformation so that the economic transformation could take place. Interestingly, this was presented to the White House in April of 1991. It was based on the same principles as the Polish episode. It was completely rejected by the White House. We're making no bargains. We're giving no help, no financing for the Soviet Union, no nothing. And I was a little surprised. Gorbachev was a little more surprised. He came back from the G7 summit in Houston only to be abducted and kidnapped uh, in that attempted coup that summer. He came back empty handed. And that was the end of the Soviet Union and the end of Gorbachev and uh, Yeltsin's rise. And just to continue, because I'm going to come to the current moment in, in a moment, in uh, November, no, in September of 91, I got a call from Yegor Gaidar, who said, there's going to be an independent Russia, come help Russia on the economic reforms. So I went back to Moscow, to a dacha outside of Moscow, pretty run down dacha, by the way. It showed this was an empire at the bottom. Uh, and um, we worked on a strategy. And at that time in November, the G7 finance deputies had a mission led by David Mulford to come to Moscow. And Gaidar, I coached him, you have to ask for a debt standstill, financial help, this, 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 and this. And I remember he came out of the meeting looking terrible. And I said, what happened, Yegor? He said, not only did they say no help, but they said, if you don't pay every penny that's due, we will stop any help on the ocean, any food shipments, anything this moment. So he was given a complete hardline block. This was Russia, not the Soviet Union. This was Yeltsin coming to power in November 1991. Well, the reforms did not go well in Russia, let's say. I lasted two years. My role was to try to help get Western money. I think they saw me as the only chance to get some relief. And um, I delivered zero, nothing. And I couldn't understand it because in Poland, I was saying to the governor and the deputy governor, everything I said, they agreed to. 
And I kept saying, I'm so good. And then everything I said about Russia, they disagreed with. But it was the same thing. And same advice. So it was geopolitics, which I didn't understand as a young person. I thought we were doing economics, not geopolitics. But they were playing geopolitics. I was playing economics. And so I was trying to give good economic advice. They were trying to basically make Russia subservient to a new unipolar American world. And I didn't understand it for a very long time. I resigned and was very unhappy and uh, went to work on many other things uh, with the UN and sustainable development and climate and other things that are really crucial. But till today, this geopolitical shadow also looms over the world. The US is an us versus them world. This is the mentality. We run the world, you're with us, or you're on the other side. And it's a very tough, wrong vision of the world because all of the real things that we need in this world need to be done collaboratively. They cannot be done under a Cold War. The, cold, the climate crisis, the broader environmental crises, the global social crises are not Cold War issues. They're global issues. And so we need a completely different mindset from the mindset that we're having right now. And the biggest problem we have, in my experience, is the U.S. mindset, which is that we're fighting a different battle. We're not fighting against climate change. We're not fighting uh, against poverty. We're fighting against an enemy. Today, the enemy is China, mainly, and Russia. But it's always someone on the other side. And this is what I grapple with every day as the, the biggest challenge that I face in the practical work that I'm trying to promote. So for 21, 22 years now, I've been advising the Secretary General of the UN, three Secretaries General, about the global scene and about the idea of sustainable development and sustainability. And sustainable development for me is a broader concept than environment. It's represented by both the sustainable development goals and the Paris Climate Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity is the three big headlines. But the idea is a world of shared economic prosperity, social inclusion and reduced inequality, and environmental sustainability. And the environmental issues are three big issues. Uh, the human-induced climate change, the fragility and even collapse of many ecosystems, and the massive industrial pollution because all three are very much interrelated and all three have to be solved by new long-term transformations of industrial technology and power sector technology. So for me, the sustainable development challenge is that broad challenge. And we're setting lots of goals, but not achieving very many of them because the world is constantly distracted. And especially, you'd be interested to know the United States government, for example, as a government, will not use the term sustainable development goals, even though every other country of the world does. There are five countries that have not had a voluntary national review of the sustainable development goals, the US, South Sudan, North Korea, and I don't recall the other two, but it's not great company, actually. Uh, so it's a real problem uh, that uh, we're fighting a Cold War for global dominance, and at the same time, uh, 
what we really need is a global, coordinated, cooperative strategy to address these challenges. So let me come up to date on the macroeconomics being at uh, your wonderful central bank and say a few words about the macro scene and how that fits into this broader challenge. Of course, we have stagflation because we've been hit by a series of supply shocks. The idea of, for me, the idea of stagflation from my dissertation in 1980 was supply shocks, uh, which is quite uh, um, seemingly pedestrian today, but I can tell you. We need a new approach. We are a, a crowded world of 8 billion people, uh, and we are facing multiple crises. We don't get along very well with each other. We are facing geopolitical crises, a hot war in Ukraine, big tensions among the major powers, but also on the economic front, uh, massive, unprecedented inequalities uh, of uh, wealth beyond imagining on one side and extreme poverty on the other. And all of this is coming together with uh, environmental damage and future threats that are also unprecedented at a global scale. After all, 8 billion people, uh, average uh, output per person, uh, depending on how you measure it, uh, somewhere between 10 and $20,000 uh, uh, per person, again, with measurement issues. But in any event, that's a big world economy. Uh, that's an economy of uh, $100 trillion or more doing incredible damage to just about every ecosystem, fishery, water supply, uh, climate that we have. So all of this means the, the world economic system is not working properly. Uh, <coughs> that failure was already identified, I'd say 50 years ago, when the collision between the economy and the environment first came to the global awareness at the Stockholm summit in 1972. It was really clear by the time of the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, but because of failures of our institutions, failures of our political imagination, and uh, failures of our economic ethics, we're not solving these issues. Uh, my country, the United States, is more interested in geopolitics and in uh, U.S. hegemony than it is in global prosperity. Uh, and uh, this is a huge crisis because the U.S. is uh, wealthy, but not at all generous. It puts its resources into the military. It, it, the budget uh, of the U.S. Uh, for uh, military purposes is about a trillion dollars a year. The budget for development aid, uh, well, it's it's tiny, uh, maybe 30 or 40 billion dollars a year, maybe three or four percent of the military budget. And then somehow the American leaders are uh, confused uh, why uh, the U.S. isn't liked more and so on. Uh, so all of this means that we have a tremendous amount of confusion about what we should be doing and how to go about doing it. So what's, what's the way out of this? The way out of this is first a, a, a proper understanding of our realities uh, in the world in the 21st century. And our realities are a world with advanced technology, incredible inequality, and massive environmental devastation. So what do you do about that? Uh, the core idea of what we should do is sustainable development, which means that these technologies should be available for human well-being everywhere, that people have basic economic needs, proper diet, 
access to health care, access to education, access to digital services, access to electricity that need to be respected for everybody, that uh, we should be investing in technological transformation so that the energy that we undoubtedly need to feed and clothe uh, and provide for 8 billion people is safe, green, renewable energy, not fossil fuel based energy that is wrecking the climate. And we need to understand that in today's world, no small part of the world can run or should aim to run or should even think about running the whole world. Unfortunately, the North Atlantic region, including the UK and the United States and Western Europe, got used to the idea that uh, they ran the show. Really, for the last 200 years, the world has been dominated by North Atlantic countries. Britain, of course, swallowed up India completely by uh, 1858 in the British Raj. Uh, Africa was divided among the European imperial powers uh, at the end of the 19th century. The United States got into the act after World War II in a very big way with military bases in 80 countries around the world. Come on, uh, this is uh, pretty outrageous, actually. Uh, and the American mindset was, well, the Americans have to run the world or the world's going to fall apart, uh, as if the whole world is waiting for 4% of the world. And by the way, 4% that doesn't have a very good sense of history or geography telling the rest of the world what to do. And uh, it doesn't work. So we're moving from a North Atlantic world to a multipolar world. That doesn't sit very well with the U.S. policy leaders who want this to be a U.S.-led world. But we should also be clear, we've got lots of tensions all over the world, uh, and some of them have nothing to do with the United States. Some of them just have to do with the interactions of other countries. And this is also extremely dangerous. We need India and China cooperating, uh, really cooperating, not as uh, antagonists, but as two giants that are cooperating with each other. We need uh, both uh, cooperating with the African Union and not the African Union as some fringe in the world, but as a uh, region that has 1.4 billion people, almost exactly the same number as in India and in China. But Africa has been marginalized for hundreds of years by the major powers, slave trade, imperial rule, uh, continued poverty. This is not acceptable either. So my view is sustainable development, multipolarity, global cooperation, and investing properly in our future. And I think that there are a few key pillars of this that I would emphasize. One is that unlike governance of the past, we actually need quality governance, governments that know what they're doing and that can think ahead and look ahead for 20 or 30 years. The energy transformation, for example, isn't something you accomplish in a year or two. It requires 30 year forward thinking to decarbonize the energy system. That's a big, complicated challenge. It's not going to be accomplished by the market. It's going to be accomplished by uh, public policy combined with market forces, but led by public policy. But governments need to understand the challenge and how to proceed. So this is one point. Second, solutions are going to require transboundary cooperation neighbors need to cooperate with each other, even Pakistan and India, uh, all through South Asia. We actually need countries talking with each other. We need to put aside ancient enmities 
and get onto practicalities. The Indus River Valley, the Punjab, the uh, um, protection of the uh, Himalayan region. This is a joint activity for Pakistan and India. We need cooperation, as I mentioned, of China and India, even a power system that spans the two giants sharing renewable energy uh, systems. So this is a, another kind of cooperation that's needed. The third area that is critical is finance, because you have to pay for this transformation. And finance involves many, many issues. Uh, it involves how budgets are organized. Governments actually need more revenues because they have a responsibility to ensure that education and healthcare and infrastructure reach the poor people, not just the rich people. So the rich people will be reached by the market, but the poor people will not be reached by the market. They will be ignored by the market. So in this sense, we need uh, public policy to ensure universal access. And this is crucial. And the final point that I would mention is we need peace among the major countries. We are not going to achieve any goals in a conflict-ridden world. And somehow, too many politicians have forgotten diplomacy. They think that war is the only approach or military buildup. Everybody's talking about building up the military right now. What a tragedy and what a waste of resources. And when you look at how horrible these wars are, like the war in Ukraine right now, Ukraine is being devastated by a war between the U.S. and Russia that is being fought on Ukraine's territory. This is actually a U.S.-Russia war, but the Americans uh, say, well, it's good. The Ukrainians are dying, not the Americans. It's a kind of sick idea, but the U.S. pours in the weapons. It wants to expand its military alliance. Uh, Russia says, no, we don't want NATO on our border. Stay away. You end up with a conflict where neither side hears each other. And then Ukraine thinks, OK, we want to be safe. Uh, so they think being safe sides with the United States, but it's ending up getting them destroyed because all it is is being in between two giant superpowers, each one just uh, trying to be the more powerful one. It's worse than kids in a playground, except that hundreds of thousands of people's lives are being destroyed. So we're not going to have sustainable development in a world of conflict. We're not going to have sustainable development in a world in which military alliances have divided the world. I would really also hope that India is a great civilization and a, and a, a great uh, nation is uh, not going to fall into a trap of, well, we're with the Quad siding with the United States against China. This would be a disaster. This is just a simple minded thinking uh, in the world today. Nobody should be against anybody. What we need is common problem solving. We need to understand why different parts of the world have their concerns and we should listen to them. We should listen to what the red lines of different countries are so that the big powers back off from each other and don't make this kind of war. We should understand that we're at the end of the North Atlantic led world system and that everybody wants a, a chance at well-being and prosperity right now. And, you know, maybe 200 years ago, uh, the British could say we we run the world or 75 years ago, the Americans could pretend they run the world. But we're way past that right now. Uh, we're in a world where people are literate. They have access to information. They want their say. They want a world that is fair for everybody. So this is what the ethics of the 21st century are, uh, that we should have shared prosperity, peace through diplomacy, rather than military alliances and wars, 
a long-term perspective because we have long-term complicated challenges and cooperation, especially between neighbors, because it's neighbors that share rivers, it's neighbors that share ecosystems, it's neighbors that share uh, uh, coastal waterways, it's neighbors that can trade with each other at the lowest cost. So we need global cooperation. Start with Cy Hirsch uh, and yeah. uh, and his yeah. uh, Substack posting a couple of days ago. Uh, yeah. It it uh, wasn't a shock, but he filled in uh, lots of interesting uh, bits uh, of this story. Um, I wait, waited, uh, and not surprisingly, in vain for some reaction from uh, the U.S. media. I I didn't see a word. Uh, I, I may have missed it from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, from places where a lot of people uh, look to get some information. So no mention of it. But basically, uh, you know, Seymour Hirsch, who is the greatest investigative reporter of, uh, of my lifetime uh, and has uncovered countless stories, uh, seemingly got some good sources to talk and explained how the U.S., blew up Nord Stream uh, and uh, gave a lot of interesting information. What, what's notable for me, aside from the complete silence uh, in, uh, in the United States uh, about this, is first, I haven't seen anybody uh, other than small possible corrections here or there go after the main story uh, and the kind of flat denial from the White House and from the CIA is uh, hardly convincing or informative or the flat denial from the government of Norway doesn't mean anything. Nobody went after the substance. A lot of people went after Hirsch, but that is par for the course and also meaningless. So I would say that the story uh, is, is passing muster. It certainly makes sense to me. It has uh, full credibility. It confirms uh, more or less what I believe from the first moment that uh, of course, the U.S. did it. Who else? Uh, and um, that it was a terrible thing to do. Now, what's interesting, I think, for us is to watch really uh, what happens in Germany uh, after mm. this. This is the only place where I think uh, this story uh, is of real direct political interest enough that it can stir something uh, because after all, the U.S. blew up a, a critical piece of infrastructure, mm -hmm. absolutely critical for the German economy. It's mm -hmm. a little weird that Germany's main ally uh, directly contributed mm -hmm. to the destruction of uh, German economic well-being. And um, at least some uh, Bundestag members uh, on the left and the right outside of this coalition are asking, well... Mm -hmm you got to tell us at this point. And uh, I don't expect that to go away. So that's what I take away to be the, the, the main interesting follow-up is what does this mean inside Germany and will it have uh, uh, political legs? And my guess is that it will, uh, that you can't just make this go away. Uh, and it's it's pretty clear there's no denying uh, the U.S. culpability at this point. I, I agree with all of that. Briefly, if the if this was untrue, I would have expected personally that the director of the CIA, who is you know one of the key decision makers, somebody at that level would be coming out and saying this is untrue. So we've not had that kind of denial and about Germany, which is a country which I have some knowledge of. I think you're absolutely right. I think this is a long fuse. Uh, this is a bomb with a very long fuse, but it could play out. And for the record, reports today in the British media that the relationship between the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, and his foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, have compl has completely broken down. Apparently, they're not even talking to each other. Um, Scholz is furious with her. They're careful not to mention Nord Stream, and I'm not suggesting anything. I'm not suggesting Baerbock was in any way involved in that. But apparently, uh, Schultz is very angry that, Be uh, that Baerbock was intriguing, as he would see it, 
uh, with um, other Western allies about getting tanks to Ukraine, something that Schultz didn't want to do. And he's discovered that um, Baerbock was going around urging other, other NATO states to do it. And I mean, there's already tensions there. And I suspect this is going to increase those tensions even more. Anyone not speaking with Baerbach is a friend of mine. Uh, that's uh, all <laughs> I can say. Uh, unbelievable, the complete and total collapse of German diplomacy uh, and her militarism is uh, beyond uh, uh, any boundaries uh, and any sense of Germany's uh, real interest. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, the sooner the better there is a split between uh, uh, them, uh, absolutely, uh, this is good for the world. You sense, although obviously uh, um, Schultz is very wobbly and maybe without the capacity to draw a real line, uh, he is pretty clearly reluctant uh, on what is this escalatory moment right now. And that's good. Uh, she is clearly the opposite, uh, and uh, that is a danger. And what is interesting about Hirsch's story, of course, is uh, he exactly explained who the small group that runs U.S. policy uh, really is. Not not that it's a surprise, but uh, Blinken, Newland, uh, Sullivan, and, and Biden. Uh, these are the four neoconservatives in charge. It's interesting to me, uh, I had some outreach uh, with the uh, congressional people. Let's just say they said it's impossible, this story, it's false. I wrote back, I said, well, I think it's true. <laughs> uh, it makes perfect sense. I explained some things. No, no, it, it can't be uh, true. I said, no, 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 it, it, it actually really is. No, I would have known. And I, I said, you know, they're lying to you. Uh, actually, Hirsch is quite interesting in one of the details explaining how bureaucratically uh, uh, it was that they decided not to tell Congress on this. But what's interesting from the U.S. point of view, we have a Republican-led lower house right now. They could take interest in this. Uh, they could ask the question, who in Congress was informed about this. My guess is from what I can see, the answer is nobody, actually. Mm. Uh, not only from what Hearst says, but even from the interactions that I'm having. If that's the case, first, it wouldn't be a surprise. This is a typical CIA operation. Uh, but it also could, even strangely enough, in, in the neocon uh, heart, heart of the empire, uh, have implications because there is a, an opposition-led house right now. And that, that could matter, actually, when, when I come to think about it. I mean, what I would simply say about that is this. I mean, you know, many people in Congress may support, you, you know, the war with Ukraine. They might want escalation. But I can't believe that they will be happy to have been completely kept out of the loop. I mean, these people, I mean, that's not, I mean, unless American Congress people are completely different from politicians and MPs and members of parliament in other countries, this goes so much against their prerogatives, I would have thought, that, you know, whatever feelings they might have about the war, I can't imagine that they would like this. I think you're right. Uh, I... I wrote back uh, uh, in, in one communication, you've been lied to, uh, and I did not hear a response, no, I haven't. I think I, I heard somebody thinking about that reality uh, on the other side from the silence that followed. Uh, I think uh, this was pretty brazen. Uh, I don't think Jake Sullivan's uh, the most talented uh, of, of all uh, senior players in the administration. And, and I think he cooked this up and I think he kept Congress out of the loop. And, and uh, I think there will be some questions raised.
Anyway, let's let's not focus too much on this because we can discuss all this for, forever. But I mean, it's part of. A, I mean, all this this issue is part of a bigger, larger sort of story, and um, we discussed that in our previous program. And the fact that we're drifting ever deeper into a confrontation now with the Russians, we don't seem to be able to get off this escalator. I mean, are you worried about this? I mean, are people in the United States worried about this? Is people, are the forces now coming forward, speaking out against it? I sense there are actually. I think that you're starting to see some pushback. But what is your feeling? Well, look, you know, once once every couple of months, we have uh, at least an opinion survey. It's just about the only time that there's actually some sense of where the public is on on this. And the answer is uh, that on the Republican side of and the rank and file in the in the country, there's opposition to the war. There's a feeling that uh, the U.S. has already done too much. Uh, there's certainly no groundswell of support for any further escalation. On the Democratic side, I think there's basically division because Democrats follow their president. Uh, the president says we should do it, but people are very uneasy about it. What is overwhelmingly the case, though, not surprisingly, is none of this depends on public opinion uh, in its uh, motivation. This is not coming from a groundswell of public support for Ukraine or anything like that. No one's asking the public anything about this. Of course, if the public will turns against it, that will have some effect in Congress, modest as it is. The fact that the Republican base doesn't want more and the fact that one of the two houses in the U.S. is Republican-led is significant, actually. You can't openly call for large appropriation anymore. Biden's going to have to find other ways to stick in more money or weapon systems, things that he can do by executive order. There's no instinct to raise a, a public debate on this. Uh, now, what's happening in the senior reaches of, of politics? Of course, we know there that there's a heated debate between sensible people, uh, starting with the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Milley, who says this is the moment where we can uh, stop what is uh, right now on a losing path and get something versus the, the hardliners who are not only ideologically dug in, but now politically in a deep hole, uh, obviously. And that starts with the president, but especially a foreign policy team that he hired. Uh, as you've been uh, rightly uh, referring to, this RAND study is, is quite interesting. Not only is it you know, basically sensible, but obviously someone asked RAND to say to the political leadership, you're digging it a hole that is very deep and not good for American interests. So at the elite level inside the executive branch, there's no great enthusiasm about anything that's happening, that to say the least, there is a division between the neocons and I would say more realist, sensible people. Congress, uh, I think we have learned, is pretty much out of the loop on this right now. But, you know, as I've just said, the Republicans uh, in both uh, chambers are not going to be enthusiastic. Uh, this is definitely uh, uh, a a period of rapidly diminishing support and interest. And I give it a few more months to play out. Of course, a lot will depend on on the battlefield and and uh, all of this desperate attempt by uh, by Britain or by uh, Zelensky and others to uh, maximally commit. So uh, without Further ado, uh, I ask you to join me in a uh, warm welcome our guest of tonight, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Wow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Fook. It's so wonderful to be back here because we've had 
fantastic discussions over the last 10 years here. And uh, please know how incredibly innovative CIRSD is and how incredibly uh, foresighted it was of VOOC to put together the two themes of international relations and sustainable development. He had a little bit of an inside track because he led for the whole world the sustainable development initiative which brought us the sustainable development goals so that's quite a historic contribution. But uh, Vuk knew then as a world leading diplomat engaged in sustainable development that success in saving the planet was going to depend on success of geopolitics and um, whether we can be successful is still hanging in the balance. So we came together, you invited me kindly 10 years ago in this forum, this venue, uh, where we uh, celebrated your idea of launching CIRSD and, and this publication. Then uh, a year after that, we discussed one of the most poignant uh, and uh, difficult topics in modern history, and that was the origins of World War I, something that this region knows all too well. And of course, the, the backdrop of that discussion that we had in 2014 was, can we avoid sleepwalking into disaster again in the 21st century? And who would have thought that we would be meeting again this evening when that question is uh, actually front and center for the whole world because I think it's a backdrop to our discussion, just one very sobering point and I'm eager to speak with you tonight uh, about it. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which uh, many of you will have heard of, uh, in 1947 established something called the Doomsday Clock, which is uh, also called the minutes to midnight clock. And the idea of these atomic scientists was that they knew back in 1947 that they had, through the brilliance of their science, created something that for the first time in human history could really destroy humanity. And they sensed that it was a danger unlike anything that humanity had ever experienced before because while well, humanity is able to kill each other in large numbers and has done so throughout history, having a weapon that could end the planet was something different. And so they made this doomsday clock. And when they launched it in 1947, they put it at seven minutes to midnight, seven minutes to disaster. And over the years since 1947, the clock has generally moved a little closer to midnight because the weapons became more and more powerful. And because a few years ago, they told the world that it's not just nuclear war, but it's environmental catastrophe that could also doom humanity. But at some points, such as the end of the Cold War, the hand was moved back from midnight several minutes. And for me, that's very poignant because what we're going to discuss tonight in my professional life started 34 years ago when I became an advisor in this region to Ante Markovic uh, in uh, federal Yugoslavia in 1989 and to the Solidarity Movement in Poland, and to Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, his economic team uh, for the Soviet Union. And we thought then, 30 plus years ago, that the tensions would be reduced. And that uh, Gorbachev, who for me is a hero, even though he's reviled by many in, in his own country, I, I think through a deep misunderstanding, but in any event, for me, he's a hero because he was a person of peace. And uh, 
maybe that's in a way why the Soviet Union ended, because he did not want to use force to hold things together. He wanted to use persuasion. But be that as it may, his idea was that there could be a peaceful, common European home. That was his great idea. And I signed up for that. I thought that really is a wonderful idea and a wonderful way to spend one's effort and one's time. And I got stuck with that idea 34 years ago, and I'm still completely stuck with it today. So I'm deeply frustrated by what's happening. And what we're going to discuss a bit is how we got from those uh, very optimistic days to today. But just to make the point, what was seven minutes to midnight in 1947, and then was, uh, I think, 12 or even more minutes to midnight when they put the hands back further from disaster, is now, as of last week, 90 seconds to midnight. What the scientists are saying to us is a minute and a half to disaster. And what they're conveying by their announcement last week is that we are on the threshold of nuclear war again for the first time in 60 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in some ways more ominous now even than 60 years ago because there's a hot war to start with. And this is a war between the United States and Russia, have no doubt, even though the soldiers dying in Ukraine are Ukrainian soldiers, the weapon systems and the intelligence and the sighting and uh, the finance is all the United States.